ready to reimagine the future of humanity and unlock your true potential. Welcome to Reimagining Humanity's Future and Yours, hosted by Dr. David Bruder, an internationally renowned integrative psychologist, human potential expert, author, and social change catalyst, as he delves into the most urgent issues of our time. With the world facing unprecedented challenges and social and political divides growing deeper, it's time to take action. Each episode of this groundbreaking series will empower you with invaluable insights, strategies, and tools to heal these divisions and restore personal freedom and societal well-being. Whether you're a concerned citizen, a courageous leader, an influential figure, or an ambitious entrepreneur, reimagining humanity's future and yours will guide you on a transformative journey. Discover your unique role in creating a brighter future for yourself and society at large. Dr. David Gruder will draw upon his extensive knowledge and experience to provide practical solutions for shaping the world we live in. With his passionate exploration of social change, he will help you navigate through the complexities of our time and inspire you to make a meaningful impact. So, prepare yourself for an eye-opening experience as we delve deep into the heart of the matter. Reimagining humanity's future and yours will challenge your perspectives, ignite your imagination, and equip you with the tools you need to reimagine and redefine the world around you. The time to transform our future is now. Join us on this incredible journey and enter a new era of possibility. For more information on Dr. David Gruder and the Reimagining Humanity's Future and Yours, visit www.rhfy.ca. Welcome to Reimagining Humanity's Future and Yours, where together, we create a brighter tomorrow. Now, here is the host of Reimagining Humanity's Future and Yours, Dr. David Gruder. Well, welcome back to the Reimagining Humanity's Future and Yours show, where we dare to delve into the root causes of today's biggest challenges and illuminate practical steps to address them that allow humanity's best future to emerge. I'm your host, Dr. David Gruder. Is love a woo-woo concept for businesses and governance or a critical overlooked success ingredient. This episode's guest, renowned leadership expert Steve Farber, illuminates the damage created by an organization's love deficits and offers practical tips for infusing operationalized love into your culture's DNA to drive high-level engagement, collaborative innovation, unwavering loyalty, die-hard supporters, and ultimately bottom-line results that propel your business or government group to new heights. Ranked on Inc.'s Global Top 50 Leadership and Management Experts list, my friend and colleague Steve Farber is a Wall Street Journal and USA Today best-selling author and the founder and CEO of the Extreme Leadership Institute. His first book, The Radical Leap, A Personal Lesson in Extreme Leadership, was named one of the 100 best business books of all time. His fourth book, Love is Just Damn Good Business, was listed by Book Authority as a top business strategy book. His most recent book, Twisted Business, Lessons from My Life in Rock and Roll, was co-written with J. French, uh, J. J. French, founder, manager, and guitarist of the iconic rock band Twisted Sister. Steve has been writing songs and playing guitar for 50 years himself, and it doesn't take much to convince him to play during one of his keynote speeches, which he delivers frequently in the U.S. and around the world. Welcome to the Reimagining Humanity's Future in Your Show, Steve. Thank you, David. It's great to be with you and to see you, albeit virtually. Indeed, indeed. Well, you know, building on what Peter Drucker, the grandfather of management wisdom, said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I'd add that culture serves love for dinner. 
And Steve, you, you've been at the forefront in equipping businesses to thrive through infusing love into their operations. And I'd like to start our discussion during this first episode segment by having you illuminate the symptoms that businesses suffer from that they don't initially realized or realize or caused by love deficits. So what are some of the most common symptoms you've seen of that? Well, you know, we're seeing uh, we're seeing a lot of it nowadays in the uh, in the the so-called popular culture or collective conversation that we're having. We hear it um, called things like nowadays quiet quitting, the great resignation, uh, you know, this sort of uh, malaise, this angst that has come up a lot of it in the, you know, COVID and post COVID world um, where people just feel um, really disengaged, uh, and, uh, kind of dead about their work. So the way I look at it is, first of all, this is, this is nothing new. I mean, we're calling it, we're calling it new things, but we've known now for, man, it's decades <clears throat> that most people are disengaged from work, right? The Gallup studies have been going on for literally decades and it doesn't get any better year after year. Uh, most people are disengaged <clears throat> or and or cynical, even worse. 71% year over year are, yeah. dis are yeah, highly goes, disengaged or disengaged. It goes up and down, but it never gets it never gets any better. Yeah. And to me, that that is the most uh recognizable symptom of simply put, a lack of love in the experience of going to work. So this is this is a really great and important starting point because the connecting these dots is probably for a lot of people only obvious with 2020 hindsight. Yeah. So what you're what you're re really saying is that symptoms like quiet quitting, the great resignation, uh, those those are symptoms that people don't feel loved at work. And the, the symptoms that that creates are disengagement and deadness and lack of purpose and lack of motivation and lack of collaboration. And, uh, and, and frankly, at the more extreme end, uh, pilfering and, and piracy. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, um, you know, if you if you don't have a connection of your heart to your work, uh, the whole ethical discussion is something that I think you know a thing or two about uh, <laughs> becomes becomes uh, you know it 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 just comes right to the forefront. Um, if I don't care about this place, um, I'm I'm more like or feel even cynical or negative about it. Perhaps I'm more likely to do things that uh, that are not ethically sound, which goes beyond not doing the best job I could do, not being as productive as I can be, et cetera. So yeah, there, there are far reaching implications in, in all of this, but you know, it's not just 2020 hindsight. It's, it's in the moment. I mean, you know, when you, when you have a conversation with, with somebody at a party, for example, and, and you ask, you ask this semi fictional hypothetical person, um, Tell me about your work. What do you do? How do you like it? And if that person said to you, um, oh, it's awful. It's awful. I, I, I hate it. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm there to make a paycheck and I'm looking for something better. And, you know, my boss is an idiot and all that. You know, your, your response to that is not going to be surprise. It's just not. You know, you might feel empathy for them and feel sorry for them and maybe want to help them find something better. But you're not going to be well, are you kidding? <laughs> your boss is an idiot. You think your boss is an so think of the opposite scenario. You're at that same party a couple of minutes later, you walk across the room, you talk to somebody else, and you say to that person, you know, you're making the small talk. What do you do? Yeah, okay. Well, how how do you like how do you like your job? And that person says, I love it. I love it. I mean, I've got great friends at work. I can't I can't wait till Monday. You know, I uh that's where you're gonna experience surprise. Right. Yes. Like, really? and so what does true. that tell us? What does it tell us? That's unusual. The yes. other is not. 
And that's exactly the reverse of how it ought to be. Exactly. And so I, I really, uh, I'm, I'm telegraphing ahead. Uh, we have more time left in this segment, but in the next segment, I really want us to delve further into more of the root causes of why things are the opposite of the way they are. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to stretch our conversation a little bit beyond just the business world, because I believe that the same problems that you're describing and that you're seeing and, and the symptoms you're seeing in business actually apply also to governing groups and government agencies. They're, they're similarly impaired by these symptoms. Could you speculate a, a little bit about the connection or, or why that would be true in governance yeah. as well? Yeah. I mean, my first response to that, David, is uh, you, you think, <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it, so I, I do have, have some thoughts on that and I want to qualify them a little bit by saying, you know, I, I spend most of my life, um, my professional life in, in the business world. Um, and, you know, I do a lot of work with nonprofits as well. I have had some uh, exposure to government groups uh, for example, I've I've spent time with and spoken to um, the Department of Defense, which is kind of an inter interesting place to talk about love. Um, but uh, but there is a difference, I think, um, in in elected officials. You know the old saying, um, "All politics is local," right? Uh, what we find is that that um, people have a very low opinion of Congress, for example, but those same people tend to have a very high opinion of their own elected official from their area, their, you know, the person they elected. So that's an interesting dynamic. Um, the difference is that at work, the people like that, you know, person at the, at the party we were just talking about, saying, my boss is an idiot, or I love my boss. They're, they're having direct experience with that person every day. So it's very up close and personal. Whereas our elected officials, we tend to uh, communicate or be communicated at by them through a series of sound bites and through a you know pretty a pretty significant filter. And does the problem that we have now with the, the polarized world that we live in, uh, particularly in the in the in the political arena, does that come down to a lack of love? Pretty obvious. Pretty obvious that it does. Uh, if I was really a, a, as as a as a politician. If I was acting from a place of love, I would truly be acting in a way that I feel is going to benefit as many people as possible. Whereas what a lot of these folks are doing um, on both sides of the political spectrum or all across the political spectrum. Yes. yes. It's about it's about it's about me. It's I want to get reelected. I want to what do people want to hear? What are the things I need to say for people to respond in a way that will will get me reelected or keep me in power. I mean, that's, we all know that we all know it. Um, so I think it's a much bigger challenge in the government arena. It could be just because it's not my wheelhouse, but in business, we have an opportunity, I believe to prove that these divides don't have to exist because in, in a business, what happens? You know, all kinds of people that come together from all across the political spectrum, all different backgrounds, ethnicities, um, et, et cetera. And we focus on a common objective and we help each other out and we collaborate and we, and we see our results. Um, we should great. be able to do that on a broader scale. Uh, I think you're spot on in the work that I've done with, uh, with elected officials and, and appointed officials. Uh, and I think what I want to underline before we go to break momentarily is that the divides that you were talking about, not only do they not need to exist, but I think you're spot on that it's the business world that gets to prove that, that as business steps into making love profitable, there are going to be more and more people in government that are going to catch on to that. Sure. And I, I agree. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be back after a short break after which you and I, Steve, we're going to 
delve into the root causes of love deficits in businesses, and we'll touch a little bit also on how that impacts governance as well. So stay tuned, lots more to come. I'm gonna stay right. Are you interested in evolving with the times and becoming all you can be? Don't you wish there was one place to find the latest information to help guide you through the process? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio TV. Join me on my mission to find the latest evolutionary knowledge and tools. The guests on Mission Evolution are leading experts in a wide variety of divergent topics including allopathic, holistic, and integrative medicine, epigenetics, enlightenment, quantum physics, meditative practices, environmental issues, spiritual evolution, trauma healing, and so much more. Mission Evolution Radio TV is aired worldwide through the Exxon Broadcast Network, Exxon TV Channel 32 on Simul TV. You can enjoy our archives of radio or TV shows with our compliments at www.missionevolution.org. Come see the amazing lineup of guests and topics. With more than 200 episodes to choose from, you're sure to find what you're looking for. Visit www.missionevolution.org. Well, welcome back. Before the break, my guest Steve Farber illuminated some of the most common symptoms of love deficits in organizations, symptoms that businesses, nonprofits, and government groups don't usually realize are caused by love deficits until Steve gets his hands on them. And in this segment, we'll unpack the root causes of love deficits in businesses and perhaps also in government and why it's been difficult to figure out what to do about these. So, Steve, let's kick this off by you sharing a bit about what you've found are the root causes of love deficits in businesses. Yeah, I think there's um, there's one primary root cause of the deficit, the love deficit. I, I, I love the way you say that. <laughs> Not terminology that I've used, but it's it's accurate. You're welcome um, to use it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that, yeah, that's already that's already going to happen. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so it's um, I think it's it's really cultural conditioning. It goes and it goes way back. We've been conditioned to believe that love is no place at work. I mean, it's, it's really as simple as that. You know, work is a love is something that that you. Um, that you want and and have and strive for with your family and with your friends, but you go to work and it and it no longer applies. It just doesn't matter there because work is you know it's it's not personal. It's business, right? If that's something that's been part of our cultural you know language for a very long time. Um, you know that business is is a um, rational pursuit. Um, that it's it's about the bottom line. It's about making decisions uh, that uh, that will will get you you know more profitability, greater market share, all the things that we that we strive for as businesses, and uh, and it's almost like human beings are incidental in all of this. That's conditioning that goes that goes pretty far back to the you know, beginning of the industrial age, right? When when suddenly um, work became uh, widget widgetized and uh, you know automated and all that. So we're experiencing the vestiges of that, I believe. Uh, and of course, it's absurd. It's it's a totally absurd notion. It's it's just something that we made up. Uh, to say that love has no place at work is, I mean, it really is. It's it's kind of insane um, because we are literally, and as you know, literally is a word I use. Literally, we are <laughs> we are literally the same person at work we are at home, literally. Same human being, 
same physiology, same DNA, same memory. It's not like we arrive at work. If you work in an office and rip your heart out of your chest and leave it thriving, throbbing on the curb uh, until the end of the day, where on your way home, you just stuff it back in and go home. We're the same person. Uh, so the deficit comes from this, um, almost like this, this, uh, What's the, what's the one I'm looking for? It's like an, an agreed upon delusion. Let's all just agree that love doesn't have any place here. And I can't prove this, but I believe that most people don't really believe that. I, I believe that most people already believe that love is good business. The problem is most people don't believe that most people believe that love is good business. So we just kind of agree to, to subscribe to this, this false notion that love has no place at work. And, and yet um, when people, and I know this from my experience, when, when people hear this idea and it, it resonates with it's like, yeah, I've always felt that. I've, I, yeah. And they just hear somebody like me who's got no no skin in the game for you know for their individual business. Somebody like me comes along and says, "No, that love thing, yeah, you apply it at work too." It's like, oh, okay. It's not like suddenly the light turns on and they were in a, you know a, a, a jerk a, a minute ago, and now suddenly they're you know they've they've transformed. No, it's just that they. It's almost like they're given permission to act on instincts that they've already had. So I think that's the ultimate cause in all of this is just this agreement that we have made, this, this false contract that says love has no place here. So uh, I, you've said so much juicy stuff. I'd like to unpack some of it in a little bit more detail. Sure. And uh, I'll start with where you just wrapped up, which is, uh, we might be the same person at work, but we've been conditioned to pretend not to be. Yes, exactly. And uh, that that's, um, you know, that it's it's kind of like a uh, love has no place at work is an agreed upon pretense that most people in actuality don't believe. And I understand that you're not able to cite empirical um, research evidence for that. But frankly, between you and me and our audience, I don't think any of our listeners need that empirical evidence in order to understand and appreciate and, and agree with that common sense truth. Yeah. So that's the first piece that I that I want to unpack or or wanted to underscore. Yeah. Further. So so there's um you know this idea that we're we pretend that we're not the same person. It's an easy trap to fall into because the, the truth is we play we play different roles, right? We do we do different things at work from what we do at home. It's a different task, right? So so it's kind of easy to say, well, I do different things at work. I'm I'm the you know the project lead on this on this thing at home. I'm a, I'm a husband and a father, or a, or a sibling, or a friend. And I do different things in those roles, of course, but that's very different from being a different person, right? Yes. So, so that's, it's, a, it's an easy, it's kind of an easy trap to fall into. The empirical evidence. Okay. I mean, I'm not going to cite a, a, a study, but let me just ask you this. You, the general, you, whoever is listening, do you ever have a bad day at work and have it carry over? into your evening at home. <laughs> Did you ever have, have you ever had a situation at home? Somebody gets sick, you're getting a divorce, your kid's in jail. I mean, something like that. Are you telling me that doesn't affect your performance at work and how you feel at work? Of course it does. So why is love exempt from that? If I, if I love my work, are you honestly telling me that that is not going to affect my overall experience as a human being at home as well? Of course it is. And, and of course, the reverse is also true. 
Absolutely. Uh, point well taken. So uh, another thing I want to underscore in what you were saying is uh, is about business having been bottom line primarily since the beginning of the industrial age. And uh, I think that this, this notion of bottom line is what started to be um, challenged in the beginning in the late 1990s, early 2000s, when the origins of the corporate social responsibility movement sure. started to emerge with this notion of a triple bottom line, people, right. planet, profit, right? right? And the people piece of the triple bottom line is part of profitability. Uh, and what I would uh, what I would kind of offer about that is uh, is that when when people in a business, and I want to get your opinion on this, when people in a business aren't clear about the business's true value to its customers or clients, and then in, uh, in a larger scope, its true value to society, and when they aren't also clear about their true value to helping the business provide its true value, that's where love falls off the map. That's where motivation and engagement fall off the map. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, 100% um, uh, amen, hallelujah to what you said. So am I, uh, when I go to work for a company, am I clear on what we really do here? beyond the transactional nature of our work. In other words, am I clear on the impact that we have on the world, on our customers? Um, are we doing something that's that's offering great value to people? I would hope so, um, because that's usually what we get paid for, is value to somebody. But we don't spend a lot of time thinking about what that what that is, what articulating what the higher meaning and purpose of our work is. So I think it's really important for, for leaders and businesses to do that, to have that conversation. Here's what I think we really do. And here's to your other point. This is how you're contributing to making that happen, associate. Uh, this is why your work is so important to what we're doing together and why your job is meaningful and has purpose. Because again, it does. This isn't about trying to come up with words that inspire people to think they're important when we all know they're really not. They are. And how do we know that? Because we have we have jettisoned all the meaningless jobs over the last however many decades when we started right-sizing, downsizing, re-engineering, and all that. If you're if you're working, it's because you're in fact, most people do more than one very meaningful job, right? Um, so we we can't just assume that th those things are obvious to people. Yeah. So I what agree. happens if I'm really clear on why my work is important and how it contributes, I'm more likely to love coming to work. Exactly. I totally, totally agree. And uh, as we as we draw toward a close of of this segment, I'm just going to quickly insert that the mask wearing that you were referring to obviously has been reinforced in many work settings, but perhaps it's even more reinforced in government or political settings. And that's uh, the mask wearing is anathema. It's it's the opposite of love. Uh, and so for the sake of sanity, for the sake of well-being individually and business-wise and societally and in politics, love has to come back into, uh, into prominence. And we'll be back after a short break, following which we'll get to the heart of the matter, where my guest, Steve Farber, the thought-leading founder and CEO of the Extreme Leadership Institute, will reveal to us what to look for when you want to repair love deficits in your organization. Steve, it's been a wonderful conversation so far. The best has, is yet to come, and we'll be back in a few moments.
Are you ready for a tale that will leave you on the edge of your seat? Get ready to dive into the gripping memoir by Bart Sabrell titled Moon Man. Bart Sabrell takes you on a heart-pounding journey, unmasking the truth behind America's famous Apollo missions. Prepare yourself for hair-raising encounters with agents from the U.S. government's top secret agencies. In Moon Man, Sabrell fearlessly reveals his real-life espionage adventures, shining a light on one of the CIA's best-kept secrets. Brace yourself for shocking revelations, including Sabrell's discovery of privately recorded audio exposing an Apollo astronaut's chilling plot, a plot orchestrated by the CIA. That's right, as Sabrell unveils this groundbreaking evidence, it becomes clear that there is much more to the Apollo missions than meets the eye. Could it be that we've been deceived all along? Moon Man is a gripping page-turner that challenges everything you thought you knew. It's a mind-bending journey into the unknown, where the line between truth and fiction becomes blurred. Don't miss this opportunity to uncover the secrets hidden for decades. Let your curiosity guide you as you join Bart Sabrell on his quest to find the truth. Moon Man, available now at Sibrel.com. That's S-I-B-R-E-L dot com. Prepare to have your beliefs shaken to the very core. Welcome back. In the last segment, we delved into the root causes of love deficits and organizations of all kinds. And in this segment, my groundbreaking guest, Steve Farber, will unpack for us the solution to look for once you've accepted that love actually is just damn good business and damn good governance. So, Steve, what should businesses and even governments look for in order to infuse operational love into their operations? Yeah, so that's the that's the key um, uh, word. That's the key verb, and it's the key challenge in all this. This is not about love as a as a sentiment. It's about love as a practice and a discipline. So that key word is operationalize. You know, it's, it sounds a little bit odd at first to say we need to operationalize love. But that's exactly what we need to do. In other words, it's to, it's to examine this, the answer to this question. What should love look like in the way that we do business? Right? Um, so when I work with, uh, with my clients, uh, that is the fundamental question that we strive to answer. And that question can look, the answer to that question can look very different from company to company. There are some kind of generic uh, things that we can look for, which we'll get into in a second. But it's really about asking yourself, okay, if we if we really want to take this seriously, we really want love to be the uh, the experience. We want our customers to love what we do for them, because that's where our competitive advantage comes from. That that's the business case for this whole thing, right? If they don't love what we do for them, if they don't love the experience that we create, the product or service that we offer, the combination of those two, we have no competitive advantage because anything short of that does not create loyalty, right? If I don't love it here as a customer, I'll go someplace else. It's a little cheaper or whatever. If I do love it here, I'm much more likely to stick around, tell people about it, spend more money, you know, all the things that, that we want our customers to do. So that's the starting premise. Now, how do we do that? We have to create an environment that people love working in, an environment or a culture, however you want to call it, that people love working in. If I don't love working here, it's very difficult for me to create that experience or for us to create that experience for our customers or clients in a meaningful and sustainable way over time. And as a leader, I can't create or contribute to a culture that people love working in unless I love it myself first. So it all gets very personal very quickly, right? So that's the, that's the overall kind of gestalt of what we're after. So then the question is, if we really loved our clients, what would we do differently for them? If we really loved our employees, associates, whatever terminology you, you use, what would we do? What would, what would we do? we be doing differently? What will we start doing? What will we stop doing? Et cetera. And 
what do I need to do in order to really fall in love with this place and these people and our mission, vision, and values, et cetera. So that's what I mean by operationalize. It's the do part. What do we do with this? So for example, um, I could take a look at my comp and benefits package and, and put it through that filter. Is this something that people will love having? Am I paying them what I can pay them? Am I giving them the benefits that they, that will really, you know, make a difference in their lives? So I can apply it there. I can apply it everywhere. If I have a physical environment, if we actually have a brick and mortar, you know, presence, I can look at the physical environment and say, is this a place people love coming to every day? If you look at the, uh, for example, the, the American Greetings uh, corporate office, which they call their creative studios in Cincinnati, Ohio, you walk into that place and you, you look around and you go, wow, this, I could, I would love coming to work here every day. From the artwork on the walls to the natural lighting in the place to the, the way the offices are laid out, it, it just, it's conducive to people loving being there. How do they create it? With a direct input of the people who work there. For example, the people that create the artwork for their greeting cards, they said, we need more natural light. So that's what they created when they built the new creative studio, AKA corporate yeah. office. So it's putting it through the filter. What will, what, what, what will people love? Um, do people love the way I run meetings? Do they love the way I, 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 you know, do performance evaluations? Uh, when I look at my, the, the policies, procedures, et cetera, for, for customers, will our customers love working with us or do we need to change something in order to make that happen? So that's the filter. And the answer to that question is, uh, is always going to be challenging. Because what we're doing here by asking that question is we're, we're raising the standards on everything. So, for example, if, if you bring your team together and say, okay, let's brainstorm. How can we improve customer service around here? Great. Great question. But you ask that question a little bit differently, and it's a different animal. Not what do we do to improve customer service. What do we need to do to make sure our customers love us? What have we done? We've, we've raised it. Where's the, there's my camera. Raised it way up here. I mean, that's really challenging. This is not an easy thing to do. Um, so it all, it all starts with that. Put everything through that filter. Get as many people engaged in that conversation as you can and see where it takes you. Hmm. Beautiful. Uh, so let, let me unpack this as well because this is solid Gold, I think gold even under underestimates it's platinum or titanium or something even more magnificent than gold and diamonds, uh, which is uh, the operationalizing love means running every part of a business through that specific filter that you are uh, have articulated so well. If we uh, if we really loved our clients our our customers or if we really loved our employees or associates what would we stop doing and what would we start doing uh what do we need to do and and what are starting with the executive themselves what do i need to do to fall in love with this place totally. and then the trickle down effect from there yeah and so this this notion of of looking at every aspect of a business's operations, comp benefits packages, physical environment, running meetings, performance evaluations, customer care, procedures, policies, everything. There's nothing that the question shouldn't be asked about. Exactly. Uh, and that is something that what I what I really want to emphasize about what you're saying is that oftentimes the process of asking and answering those questions requires an outside facilitator. It sure, it sure can. It sure can. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's certainly in the beginning, um, because over time, we just we want it to be just the way we do things around here. Yes. Right. We want it to be the norm. And if it's the norm, it doesn't necessarily require an outside facilitator. 
But in my experience, you know, some of my clients, when we first start working, we we agree that we're going to work together for at least two years because it can it can take that long. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you an example. OK, so there's uh, and I've, I've talked about this company a lot. I've done some case studies on it. People want yeah. to look it up. They'll find it. A company called yeah. Trailer Bridge exactly. in, in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. I'll give you one one example. They turned that company. This is in a nutshell. They turned that company around from bankruptcy into um, best place to work. Revenues in two years that exceeded the previous 23 years of the company combined and on and on it goes uh, by operationalizing love. That's how that's what they did. So, for example, they put their customer policies through that filter. Now, this is a company that uh, it's a shipping logistics company. So they ship barges of containers of stuff from mainland U.S. primarily to Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, a couple of other places. And they had a longstanding policy that unless a barge was 75% full, they wouldn't sail because they would lose money. And obviously they're not in the business to lose money. So why would we sail? But then they, they looked at it from the, the customer love perspective. They said, okay, what's the experience that our customer has? Um, so I'm shipping a car to my family in Puerto Rico through Trailer Bridge. You, the Trailer Bridge tells me it's going to be there on such and such a date. That date comes and goes. There's no car in Puerto Rico. So I call Trailer Bridge. Where's, where's my car? And they say, oh, no, it hasn't sailed yet. Why? Well, because we haven't sold enough space. Okay. So what? So what? So what was the result? Well, bankruptcy. That was the result. So they asked the question, if we loved our customer, if we really loved our customer, what would we do in that same scenario? What would we do? And then the answer is really simple. We would sail. We would sail because that's what we said we would do. And they started doing that. And again, this is the hyperspeed version of the story. They, they're never running less than 98, 99% full, more profitable than they've ever been. Their customer service scores have gone through the roof. They've won all kinds of awards and all that simply because they were willing to ask that question and then make the change necessary. And believe me, there was not an easy thing because at first you say, well, we would sail. That means you lost money on that shipment, right? Right. Initially. But they, initially. initially. But they knew that it was the right thing to do. And eventually... And pretty quickly, actually, it all caught up and went way beyond what they even. Anticipated. And that's the the important thing is yeah. that when a business is only focused on short term metrics, they miss the forest for the trees because oh, yeah. these kinds of turnarounds sometimes require biting the bullet for you know a short period of time in order to vastly expand yeah. in a in the longer term. And what does biting the bullet look like? Well, it means that maybe, you know, you're making some progress, but it's not so great uh, in, the, in the beginning. It could also mean it didn't work. You crashed and burned. And so that's how you innovate, right? You try something, right. it doesn't work. This is not about, oh, we do the love thing and everything would magically take care of itself. It's no. messy. It's, it's messy scary. and it's all about failing fast so that yes. you you adjust and you you know that it's wabi sabi that it's uh you know it's it's messy building a, a successful business is not a straight line it's it's messy uh so uh, as we wrap up this segment holders of elected office appointed office uh, and government officials also need to ask what do we need to do to cause citizens to genuinely love us? Not through propaganda, uh, right. sleight of hand or bribery, but through actual operations. And if, if people in government want government trust restored, that to me is the key. And that's part of what I'm passionate about bringing to governments as well as to businesses. Yes. So after our final brief break, we'll return for our episode's last segment, during which I'm going to ask my marvelous guest, and I, I just adore you, Steve, Steve Farber, to describe how he provides exactly what he's just said that businesses and governments should look for.
Beautiful Mind Coffee is delicious coffee your brain will love. Made with ethically sourced 100% Arabica coffee grown in the volcanic soil of the Tolima Colombia region, Beautiful Mind Coffee is roasted and ground in small batches to ensure each bag contains a wonderful full-bodied artisan coffee. Beautiful Mind Coffee contains herbal ingredients to aid in boosting your daily mental clarity and focus. Maca root powder, green tea extract and American ginseng have all been selected for their ability to support good brain health. Taking care of your brain's health now can help delay or prevent the onset of cognitive dysfunction, including dementia, Alzheimer's, and more general memory loss as you get older just by enjoying the delicious flavor of our roasted coffee and herbal ingredients found exclusively in Beautiful Mind Coffee. For more information on Beautiful Mind Coffee, visit us online at www.beautifulmindcoffee.ca. Beautiful Mind Coffee is now available at Amazon.ca. Well, before this episode's final break, my guest, business love guru, Steve Farber, told us what businesses and even governments need help with in order to outgrow their love deficits. And in this final segment of this episode, which is called Infusing Love into Business and Government, No Longer Optional, Imperative, Steve will let us know how he provides what he said to look for. And as a thank you for tuning into this episode, we'll also let you know how to access a great gift that Steve has to get you going. We'll follow that with each of us sharing the big takeaways that Steve and I each hope you've gained from this episode, and I'll then offer some closing comments. So, Steve, exactly how do you help businesses shift love from a good intention to specific behaviors? When you're brought into a business, yeah. what what is the, the magic that you provide that helps businesses ultimately become self-sufficient in their ability to keep these changes going. Yeah, thank you for asking. We have we have uh, quite a few things in in the toolbox. Um, if I could, though, let me preface it by saying, mm -hmm. um, I my clients uh, are of a particular variety, and and that is they are companies that already want to do this, right? In other words, um, I. I don't get hired by, and I have no interest in working for companies that say, you know, we think this is, we think this is a bunch of crap, <clears throat> but it's really all we got left. So let's, let's give it a whirl. No, thank you. Let me stop you there before you keep going, because I, I really want to underscore that. Uh, there's an old joke. How many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> Only one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. Right. And uh, and you're going to use your phrase about what I'm about to say in a moment, but uh, I'm going to pre-reinforce you yeah. before you keep going. <laughs> in 1988, when I uh, formed my first business, which was uh, then called Willingness Works, I entered into a covenant that was really scary for me at the time because I was expanding into larger quarters with higher overhead and all of that. And the covenant was that from that point on, I was only going to work with people and organizations that genuinely want what I most love to offer and could ethically afford to pay for it. Yes. So um, the phrase that I think you know I'm about to say is, yes. I am not in the convincing business. I'm in the confirmation business. Right. So uh, it's not my job to convince people that love is good business. It's my job to confirm the instincts that they already have and then help them to apply it. Right. So mm -hmm. so having, having said that, um, the toolbox is, depending on the client and depending on, on the degree of involvement they need and or want, we we typically start the process as as 
any decent consultant should with an in-depth um, getting to know the company analysis sort of a thing. So we have a particular survey that we use that we affectionately refer to as the beast. Uh, it's, it's very comprehensive where we're looking at the, the employee experience from a lot of, a lot of different angles and it gives us our starting point that we can measure against, you know, a year down the road. Uh, and at the same time, um, I typically, and I have, a, you know, a team that I work with, um, I typically, uh, spend most of my time getting, uh, getting to know, uh, at a very deep level, the senior, senior executive team of the company. And I work with them as a team and also one-on-one, -on -one, uh, over, you know, over a period of time. So, you know, generically speaking, we call that coaching. I have, you know, positive and negative, uh, it's more than uh, ideas about that it's particular word, more than coaching. but that, but that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, advisory sort of a thing. Uh, and then along with that, there's a certain level of, uh, training and development and education that needs to happen. So we want everybody in the organization to understand what we're up to together. What is this love thing and how does it play out? And the overall framework is, uh, love is the foundation of it, but it's the, it's the radical leap framework which is love, energy, audacity, and proof. So what we're doing is ultimately we're taking whatever it is the company is, is up to in terms of their, uh, you know, their, their strategy, their marketplace, their, 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 you know, all their objectives. And we're, we're saying this, if we can cultivate the love for whatever it is you're trying to do, generate the energy necessary to see that through, inspire people to be audacious in their pursuit of what it is that we're trying to do and prove that we mean what we say and that we're making progress along the way, that's leap, love, energy, audacity, and proof, then whatever it is we're trying to do, we have a better chance of getting that done. So we can measure very, uh, very specifically how successful we're being uh, because what are the measurements? What are you measuring? Whatever you're measuring, it should get better at the other end of this thing. This is the proverbial tide that raises all boats. So again, it's a combination of things. There's assessment, there's coaching, there's training and development. Um, and it's all ultimately about giving uh, the companies and the people in them the tools they need to put this into practice every day so that at the end of our engagement, we could step away and say, let's write a case study and let us know when you need some entertainment at an event. <laughs> sure, but, you know, it's up, it's a, we're here if you need us, but you got what you need now. That's what we're after. That's beautiful. And I want to underscore the common sense of that before we get to our episode takeaways, which is, Obviously, uh, well, my sound bite for your first step is uh, treatment without diagnosis is malpractice. Mm -hmm. And so the in-depth getting to know the company analysis survey, your beast survey, is that kind of comprehensive analysis that not only illuminates what needs attention, but can serve at the at uh, as a post-test or as an interim test for answering the question, how are we doing and how, how did we do? How have we done? Yes. Uh, and then, of course, because uh, there's always a trickle-down effect, there's got to be a process of getting to know and be, being an advisor to the executive team, both individually and as a, as a full team, so that you can then move from there with that team's full buy-in into infusing your radical leap framework into the entire culture. And the thing that I really want to emphasize for our audience, because I think it's really important for business people to understand how operationalized love is in what you do, is that they can measure whatever is important to that business to measure. Uh, and uh, those measurements are going to come out well as a result of infusing love, doing a love makeover. Uh, on a business, an operational love maker, um, and and you know the the um, uh, the the question is, 
uh, the follow-up question is, okay, so we're measuring all that stuff and, and we should get better at it, but how do we know? How do we know that it's because of that love stuff you've been doing with us that we've we've gotten better results in this? And my my answer to that is, I, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. it doesn't, I, I don't, listen, uh, it's not important to me that we that we we prove this this linear path. Are they better now? Have things changed since we started working together? That's that's all. That's all you need to know. That's all I need to know. Well, and I I'm going to I'm going to actually slightly disagree with you on that. In that, because you have a pre measure and because you're doing sure. a post measure, yes, 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 it's more than I don't care, and I understand why you're saying I don't care, but. Uh, whatever else the business is doing while you're working with them between the between the pre-test results and the post-test results, for anyone to think that those other changes aren't at least in part because of your interventions, that's just foolish thinking. It is. So, I, I, I totally agree. Yeah. It's, it's so, just, I'm just saying it in a nicer way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'm yeah. saying it in a blunter way. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I got to move on to our takeaways. Yeah. So. Steve, what would you say uh, in in just a brief sentence is the big takeaway you would like the audience to take from this episode? And then I'll share the takeaway that I have. Sure. Um, if there's if there's if I had to narrow it down to one thing, it's the, the takeaway is love as a strategic business advantage is not only possible, it's imperative. And you Wherever you are in your organization, whether you're an organization of one or you are somebody that works for a bigger company, you can move the needle forward in this through the, the uh, influence that you have on the people around you every day. Mm -hmm. So it's possible, it's imperative, and you can start doing it right now. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And... Mine is that love is a practice and a discipline, not simply a sentiment, just as integrity isn't simply an abstract concept or a good intention. It's a, it's a set of practical skills and procedures. The same thing is true about love. Combine love and integrity with providing an outstanding resource, and you've got the holy grail of business success and the holy grail of healthy governance. Yes. So, uh, yes. so as we wrap up, uh, you can access all of Steve's resources at stevefarber.com. And his gift to you is a free subscription to his Extreme Leadership Underground Daily Audio Message Series, which is uh, daily energizing two-minute stories, ideas, and inspirations from Steve Farber's extreme leadership um, uh, world to yours, which are delivered fresh to your email inbox Monday through Friday. And you can sign up for them at a very simple URL, dailyaudiomessage.com, dailyaudiomessage.com. Before I do my final comments, I want to first thank you, Steve, for being on the show and for spreading the love. Well, thank you, David. Uh, it, it's been a great pleasure. And uh, I love you, brother. I love you, brother, too.